we've talked a little bit about uh, the Federal Reserve and monetary policy. What we want to talk about now is, and we started the semester off this way, is how does money affect the economy? Um, I want to go back and talk, and this is a little bit about what we call monetary theory, but about the quantity theory of money. And what the quantity theory of money says is essentially the quantity of money in the economy is what dominates economic conditions. Okay, And there's something called the equation of exchange. that is at the center of this quantity theory of money. And the equation of the exchange is this, mv equals pq. And there's a little times in there. m is the money supply. v is the velocity of money. The velocity of money is the turnover rate, how many times each year is the average dollar spent in the money supply to purchase goods and services. Okay, and so if, and I'll use an easy number to work with, if the velocity of money is six, then that means that throughout the year the average dollar gets spent six times. And when we talk about dollars, we're talking about both currency dollars as well as checking account dollars. Okay, uh, and by the way, Sometimes economists will talk about the inverse of that, the 1 over V. And so if velocity is 6, 1 over V is, is what? Uh, 1 over 6. So then what that means is if that dollar is spent 6 times, the average dollar, 6 times a year, then 1 sixth of a year is how long it gets held. It would be held for 2 months before being spent again. Okay, but anyway, we'll just stick with the velocity of money. Um, velocity depends, yes sir? Where, do the, where does that number come from? Well, where does that number come from? And the answer is you can calculate it by dividing P times Q by M, right? So we can calculate that. It is, in more sophisticated theoretical discussions, velocity is uh, an indicator of money demand and it is influenced, and it's what I started to say a moment ago, velocity of money, how often those dollars get spent, is influenced by various things like interest rates and the state of technology and so forth and our expectations about what's going to happen in the economy. We're not going to really talk much about it today. P is the price level and by that I mean the macroeconomic price level, like the consumer price index or the uh, price deflator for consumption expenditures or GDP. And then Q is an indicator of, or uh, an index of quantity of production. Or, and then just another term that we have for this is real GDP. Okay, so anyway, basically when we say MV equals PQ, this all can be reduced. If M is the money supply, let's use some simple numbers. If the money supply is $1,000, and on average those dollars get spent six times throughout the year, then this is total spending, isn't it, throughout the year? Right? We've got $1,000 and each dollar gets spent six times. There's $6,000 worth of spending during the year. Okay? And then over here, P times Q, this is the value of all the stuff that gets produced. Or sold. If, so, if we go to all the cash registers in the United States, then there's all that stuff that gets, there's quantities of things, and each thing has its own price. And if $6,000 gets spent, $6,000 has to come through the cash registers. So this is really what we could call an identity. This must be true. All the dollars that get spent have to show up over there in the cash registers. Okay. 
So anyway, we're going to talk about this. The earliest economists that talked about this theory, and these were the classical economists, we go back about 100 to 200 years ago. This was their version of macroeconomics, and there's more to macroeconomics now, but this is a, is a, a core of discussion about macroeconomics and how money fits into the economy that we're going to work with today. But the classical economists, when they first started talking about this, they said velocity is a constant. Now, in real life, we know that's not a constant because in real life, velocity, as I said, this is really an indicator or an index of money demand. This will uh, vary over time as interest rates change and as technology changes and so forth. But we're not going to get into those issues today. And if we just assume for convenience that velocity is a constant, then here's what we say is, hey, look, changes in the money supply are reflected proportionally in, huh, that's gross domestic product, GDP. Okay, so what we're saying is if there's a 1% change in money supply, then it shows up as a 1% change in GDP. And this is nominal GDP. Okay. And this nominal GDP has two components, the price component and the quantity component, or real GDP, and then inflation. So when the Federal Reserve changes the money supply, then that will show up as a change, a proportional change in that thing that we measure, GDP. And it'll either show up as inflation, or it will show up as a change in real economic activity, or some combination. It could be half and half, or two thirds and one third, and so forth. But that's where that shows up. Now, I just drew an arrow and just said, oh, that happens. There is a transmission mechanism that we have talked about before. We don't need to spend a lot of time with it. But here's what we know. When the Federal Reserve is increasing the money supply, open market operations, the Fed goes to the banks, they buy some bonds from banks, bankers have excess reserves, they start making loans. And so back when we talked about supply and demand for credit, we showed how that if there's an increase in the money supply, there's also an increase in credit supply. And if there's an increase in credit supply, then that will affect interest rates. And so in this whole transmission mechanism, what we're seeing happen is a change in the money supply, and that is showing up as a change in credit supply. And a change in credit supply is affecting interest rates. And then as it affects interest rates, that affects consumption spending by households, and it affects investment spending by businesses. And those things then feed into a, a change in aggregate demand, which I'm sure you remember from earlier courses. And then through that channel, it affects the price level and real GDP. So there is a, a lengthy mechanism that ties these together, and I just have this sort of shorthand version of changing the money supply affects nominal GDP. And it does, but there are things that happen in the economy that if we are a little bit astute and we start watching for those, we'll notice those things happening. And it takes time for this to happen, a change in the money supply. It takes time for it to show up as a change in GDP, but some of these things happen earlier in the process. Okay, so now what we want to talk about is this. If a change in the money supply is reflected proportionally in GDP, how much of that is going to show up as inflation or a change in the price level, and how much of that is going to show up as a change in real economic activity. And by the way, it's not only real economic activity, real GDP, but also employment. Right? If we're going to produce more goods and services, we need more workers. And if we have more workers uh, with jobs, then the unemployment rate's down. So how much? How's this divided up? The Federal Reserve 
has uh, mandates from Congress, and the mandates from Congress says that basically the Federal Reserve is supposed to promote price stability and is also supposed to promote economic growth, this is real economic activity, and maximum employment. Now, that is just like do all things good. But this is the Federal Reserve's mandate, and so the Federal Reserve is trying to do these things. Let me kind of draw you a little picture, because I'm good at the pictures. Here's a road. And you can kind of think of the, <laughs> let me just add this here. This is a car driven by the Fed. Fed. And they're just going down that road. It's hard to tell front from the back, isn't it? Let me, let me just put a little speed out there behind them. Now we know which way they're going. They're backing up. Anyway, um, so the Federal Reserve, they're driving the car down the road. And really, that car they're driving down the road is the economy. The Federal Reserve is our most effective and dominant economic policy maker. You know, the president has certain powers, the power to do things, to recommend things to Congress, and the pa Congress passes laws. And when the president says something like, gosh, we need to do something, here's my recommendation, and then the Congress starts talking about that and debating it and then crafting a bill to do what the president says, about two years later, something happens, sometimes. Maybe the Congress goes, no, we're not going to do it. But it takes a long time. The Federal Reserve has these meetings every six weeks, the FOMC does, and they'll say something like, let's do this or let's do that. And then there's that vice president of the New York Fed says, I heard you. And the vice president of the New York Fed goes out and makes it happen that week. And so it takes time. I told you that there is a transmission process here. It takes time for money to get translated into economic activity, but it happens pretty quickly. And it, so the Federal Reserve is our dominant economic policymaker. And so when I say they're driving the economy down the road, I mean they are. Now, on the one side of the road, you've got inflation in, in this ditch. And then the other side, we have recession. And so the job of the Federal Reserve is to drive that car down the road without swerving into either ditch. And surprisingly enough, they, that's a difficult thing to do. It may be surprising, maybe not. The Federal Reserve, they're clever people. They've studied this. They talk about it. They have all the help in the world. They can call on anybody and get information that they need. But we've got an economy that's, you know, what, 15, 16 trillion dollars. We've got a labor force that's over 150 million people, got millions of businesses, large and small. We've got relationships with countries overseas where they're exporting and importing. <coughs> Exchange rates always changing, stock markets moving up and down. So the Federal Reserve is dealing with some powerful forces. And if they're trying to stabilize the economy, then you know it's not just a matter of doing what they want to do, but it's also read these incoming impulses and, and, and impacts coming from various sources and then basically neutralizing those and keeping that car moving down the road without swerving into either ditch. Here's the problem. If they swerve too far in one direction or the other, let's say that they say, oh, you know, we're worried about inflation, so let's tighten up on monetary policy. The real threat is they're going to run in that, that ditch of recession. Tighten up on monetary policy, reduce the money supply, because we're worried about inflation. And well, maybe you fight inflation, but maybe what happens is you also have a recession. And you know, this is a bad problem, because once you get into a recession, and you're over in this ditch, you know what normally happens, maybe you don't know, but if you drove with me, you would know. What happens is you jerk the wheel and try to get out of that ditch, and you run into the ditch on the other side of the road. You don't just go, oh, we're in a recession, I'm going to make a 3% correction. And what the Federal Reserve does, what any policymaker does, is you got a problem and you try to get out of it. And you jerk the wheel in the other direction, you run in the other ditch, and the other ditch is inflation. We went from, what, about 1965 to 1983. This was practically a generation where the Federal Reserve was basically jerking the wheel from one ditch to the other. 
The economy was not performing strongly enough in 1965, and the president saying to the Federal Reserve, come on, you gotta help me out here. In 1965, there were two wars underway. There was a war on poverty and a war on Vietnam, and the president just thought, we need a strong economy at this time. And so the president's putting a lot of pressure on the Federal Reserve, and so they accommodated that somewhat. That was a pushy president, President Johnson, and he, whatever he wanted, he really wanted, and he was relentless. There are famous pictures of uh, President Johnson confronting members of Congress and stuff like that, and he would be standing like right in their face, and the person he's talking to is leaning back, and, try, and he'd get them where there's a table behind him or something like that, and they're leaning like this, and he's leaning forward and talking to them, and after a while, they would relent. And so he told the Federal Reserve what he wanted, and they resisted, but then they finally went along. And so he says, we need a strong economy, so more money supply. And so what happened was, for a few years, the economy was strong, but we jerked the wheel in that particular case in the inflationary direction. And then we got a lot of inflationary forces build up in the economy. And then after a while, the Federal Reserve says, this just won't, we can't continue this way. So they jerked the wheel in the other direction and we went to recession. And then they jerked the wheel in the other direction, and it seemed like we were never on the road for very long until we were in a, one of the other ditches. And this went on for nearly 20 years. And so, what I'm saying to you is this is a very difficult, a challenging job. It's not just the economy makes it difficult, but also, you know, these people that run the Federal Reserve are in Washington, D.C., the people on the board, and they get a lot of advice, and they're not just getting advice from people in Congress and the President, but they're getting advice from everybody that writes a newspaper article or a column on monetary policy, they get a lot of advice from economists, and so sometimes they take bad advice or are influenced in a bad way, and we're swerving from one ditch to another. So, this is not an easy task, but it's to basically try and balance these forces off. Now, what we've learned is this. Is that the economy grows, its inherent ability to grow is about two and a half or three percent a year. And so, if I put real GDP on this axis, and here's time, you know, 1990, 91, 92, 93, and so forth, just year after year after year. What happens is the economy has this ability to grow. This would be about 3% a year, 2.5%, 3%, and this would be potential real GDP. And I'm not trying to be too specific with you here about just how much that is, if it's a 2.5% or 3% growth rate. It's someplace in that range. And what the economy actually does is something like this, is sometimes we're a little bit above potential. And I don't mean to say we're above potential, we're doing more than is possible. What I mean is that during those times that we get above the potential, then we are doing things that are not sustainable. We have a super low unemployment rate, you know, like 3%, and we have more of our office buildings and our factories and so forth being used than is sustainable, a lot of overtime work and things like that that we can do for a short while, but it's not something we can continue. And so basically what we find out is this, is that during those times, when the economy is at or near potential or above potential, then during these times, monetary stimulus basically creates inflation. That is to say, those I told you that a change in the money supply results in a change in GDP. And then it's a question of what part of GDP, the inflationary part of GDP or the real part. And so, during these times, I'll put money supply, during these times when the economy is performing at a very high level relative to potential, then monetary stimu stimulus results in inflation. And during these times when we are far away from potential, and this would be like a recession when the economy is turning downward, 
But during these times, monetary stimulus results in a change in real GDP and also a change in employment. And so this is something the um, Federal Reserve officials are thinking about when they're trying to avoid, you know, swerving one way and another into one ditch or the other. It's like, what can the economy tolerate at, the, uh, you know, at various points in time? There's not always one answer. Okay? There are these happy mediums where I get, I don't know if it's a happy medium or not, but where we're in between, where we're a little bit away from the potential, then monetary stimulus gives us a little bit of inflation. It gives us a little bit of real economic activity. So it's not one or the other, but it's a little bit of both. And so basically, this, the economy moving on, the Fed driving this, uh, this car, driving monetary policy, they have to decide where we are from a variety of different sources, you know, inputs, in order to decide what's the best policy at this point. Um, Alan Greenspan used to be the chairman of the Federal Reserve, and Alan Greenspan uh, had a bad back. And this was an important uh, thing, uh, you wouldn't think it would be, but it was an important thing in terms of making monetary policy. He had a bad back, and the way he got therapy for this was every morning he got in a hot bathtub, and he would spend like an hour in a bathtub, and he had a desk or a, some kind of shelf or so whatever, and it would go across the bathtub, and he had reams and reams and reams of economic reports and data and things like that. And that's what he would do is soak his back and, you know, get some relief from that and then look at economic data. And he was always trying to figure out where the economy is right now by looking and seeing, well, gosh, how many tractor trailers are out on the roads hauling merchandise? And how much overtime work? And what's the average length of the work week? And what's happening with inventories? And I mean, just one thing after another, and he was always trying to get a fine measure of where the economy is. It's always easy to tell where the economy is if you can wait five years and get the numbers and sort of analyze everything and have some people do studies for you and go, well, look, back 1995, here's what was going on. That's great, but making policy in real time is not an easy thing to do when we have such a big economy, and economic data is slow to come in. You know, um, we get GDP numbers only quarterly, but what will happen is we get an advanced, advanced GDP number, and that advanced number is just very early on, just a little bit of information, and then we get what is called a preliminary number, and then we get a revised number, and then it's revised again. By the time we know what the economy is doing, we are months and months and months after the fact. And you may or may not know that when we declare a recession, you know, and a recession is when economic activity starts going down. Usually it'll be a year, year and a half after the recession started before we ever find out there was officially the beginning of a recession back then. And when a recession ends, it's usually a year, year and a half later after the recession ends that we find out that officially as well. And so what I'm saying to you is real time, we don't have real time data. And we have to make economic policy in real time. So this is a very challenging thing to do. And so, you know, those policy makers that are maybe not so good at reading this data, maybe don't have a bad back or don't spend the time in the tub, um, it's kind of like driving by looking in your rearview mirror. What do you see in the rearview mirror? Oh, steer to the right, steer to the left. And before you know it, you're off into a ditch. Anyway, so this is the nature of the problem. Um, there's a little bit, uh, there's another problem, and it's this. The problem is the Federal Reserve is reluctant. They've tried it from time to time, but it's a difficult thing to do. They are reluctant to try and control the money supply directly. You know, it's like we're talking about this MVPQ kind of a model. And it sounds like you just say, you know, you turn this knob and add another billion dollars to the money supply. And that's possible, but that doesn't work out very well. And the reason it doesn't work out very well is this, is that, and there are different models or different ways of expressing this, but what happens is this, if we have the quantity of credit, 
and the interest rate up here, what's happening is the demand curve for credit is shifting back and forth. Let's say today the Treasury says, let's borrow $10 billion. Today, then, there's an increase in demand for credit of $10 billion. And let's say tomorrow a bunch of investors overseas decide they want to lend money in the United States. Here comes $20 billion from overseas. And let's say the next day some big business, IBM or something like that, wants to build a new factory and they go out and borrow $3 billion. There's shifts in the demand curve for credit all the time. And so if the Federal Reserve just said, hey, we are controlling the money supply and the supply of credit, then what we would observe is just constant and significant fluctuations in interest rates. And so the Federal Reserve is reluctant to just say, we are going to set the money supply at this amount, and that's it. Because once they do that, they lose control of interest rates. And when interest rates are unstable, it interferes with economic planning. Like if you're thinking about, I want to buy a house. And then you kind of say, hmm, OK, I, I think I could afford a house. And you call your banker up, and your banker says, oh, the interest rate's 6%. And you say, OK, uh, let me think this over. I'll talk it over with my husband or my wife or whatever. I'll just give it some thought, and I'll be back with you soon. And then you call up two days later, and they say, oh, the interest rate is 6.5%. And you say, hey, I thought you said 6. And they said, well, it was 6 that day. And then you say, well, I don't know if I can afford a house now. That just pushed my house payments up $100 a month or whatever. And maybe the next time you call, and the interest rate's, I don't know, 5.5%. They're just all over the place. One model I've seen that is, I think, good for expressing this idea is where we look at the quantity of bank reserves, but I'm going to say Fed funds. You remember the Fed's funds market is the market where bankers are lending to each other, but lending reserves. Okay, and here's the interest rate, the Fed funds rate. Okay, and this demand curve for Fed funds is the demand by banks, and it's a net demand curve. All the banks put together, some are borrowing more and some less, some are lending. So here's the demand for Fed funds, and then here's the Federal Reserve is supplying Fed funds. Okay, this is the supply, uh, supplying reserves. Okay, and so if these banks are trying to borrow Fed funds, where do they get the Fed funds? Where do they get the reserves? And the answer is the Fed supplies them through open market operations. And so the Fed can supply more or less. So what the Federal Reserve will do is this, is they'll say something like, you know, we think we need to supply a certain amount of Fed funds through open market operations to promote economic conditions we believe are correct. And if we supplied this quantity of Fed funds, then the interest rate would be this much. I, I'll say I1. I'm going to put a T there. But the idea is that we want to supply some money to the economy, and we, th that will promote the economic conditions we think are appropriate. This is the amount of money we'd like to supply to the economy. And we think if we supplied this quantity of money to the economy, then the equilibrium interest rate would be this much. And so then what they do is this. They say, OK, that is our target interest rate. We set a target, and I used a T there. We'll set a target interest rate for the Fed funds market at, you pick a number, 3%. And then what they'll do is tell the manager of the open market desk, you buy or sell government securities to keep interest rates, the Fed funds rate, at this target level. And so it, then, over time, we get fluctuations in the demand for Fed funds. And so what happens is that manager of the open market desk is changing the supply of bank reserves. But on average, if they hit this target and they did a good job of forecasting, they're supplying the right quantity of Fed funds the right quantity of reserves to banks to get the money supply growth they thought was appropriate.
And so what I'm saying to you is that we've got this idea of a change in the money supply affects GDP. And I'm saying the Federal Reserve actually controls that money supply by controlling bank reserves. And it does that by controlling the Fed funds rate. It's a, a fairly complex set of ideas altogether. But the Fed sets a target rate. Now, here's the good news. The Federal Reserve went for about 20 years and had a great deal of success at managing the economy and avoiding those two ditches. We went from, what, 1982 to about 2001, and just one recession in between, moderate inflation. And so there was an economist named John Taylor, and he studied the Federal Reserve, what they did during this period, and he came up with something called Taylor's Rule. By the way, he was at Stanford, and I think in the 1990s, uh, maybe 92 is the first time he wrote about this, and then it's been updated. But Taylor's rule said this, rule, set your Fed funds target at 1% plus 1.5 times the inflation rate minus 0.5, one half, of the gap between what? GDP potential minus GDP actual. And so when actual GDP is below potential, is this right? No, I think it would be the other way around. I'm sorry. Actual minus potential. When GDP is below potential, this would actually say, hey, we've got a negative number here. So, no, I had that right the first time. Why, why did you confuse me? I could change the sign there, couldn't I? Let's say potential minus or actual. When GDP is below the potential GDP, then that would say lower the Fed funds rate. Stimulate the economy. Put more Fed funds in. When we have inflation, raise the Fed funds target. Okay, Reduce the amount of reserves going into the banking system. And so... This is kind of a guide that the Federal Reserve uses now, this Taylor's Rule. And what they're doing is they basically will, will have a discussion on what does Taylor's Rule say. And they can always make adjustments to this. But this says this, if there were no inflation and if we we're producing at potential GDP, everything's great, they would set a Fed funds target of 1%. And then if at that point the inflation rate went up 1% up, the Fed would raise their target Fed funds rate by one and a half percent. And that would cause them, by raising their target, that would mean they're going to put less reserves into the economy. The money supply will be less, and then that will take those inflationary pressures out of the economy. Okay? And if we fall below into a recession, then this gap gets bigger and bigger. We lower the Fed funds target, meaning we increase bank reserves. And then that would increase the money supply and stimulate the economy. And this is a very short version of what the Fed does to manage the economy. But this is basically how the Federal Reserve makes policy. Then, as I say, it gives the instructions to the manager of the open market desk. The manager of the open market desk tries to hit that target by buying and selling government securities. And this happens more or less on a daily basis. Any questions about this? For example, if we're right here and we've got a gap between potential and actual, the big gap says 
lower that Fed funds target. And so if they lower the target down to here, the, and here's this sort of average demand for funds, then they would say, oh gosh, we're going to put a lot of reserves into the economy. And if we're above that target, or uh, above potential, what they would say is, gosh, raise that Fed funds target, and if this is the sort of average demand curve, if you raise that target to here, the way you would do that is by reducing reserves in the system, and that would slow down the economy by reducing the money supply. Any questions about this? I think that'll be it for the day then. So long.